Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, sometimes future, if we find out about it. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of the forthcoming The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 73, and a writer about music for various publications, including the Wall Street Journal, where I reviewed the Revolver reissue just this week. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. And he has his own YouTube channel as well, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed with Beatles-related interviews and stuff like that. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Good, Alan. A lot of stuff going on right now in the Beatle world. Well, there sure is. A lot to delve into here. Yeah. And also Darren DeVivo, DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area. He's been there since 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan and Ken and everybody out there in podcast land. Right. Okay. Um, Today we're going to do part two of the Revolver box set. Last time we talked about the outtakes. This time we're going to talk about the remix itself. But first, the news. Ken? All right. Thanks, Alan. I tell you, I do that other podcast show, Talk More Talk. I did one Monday. Between Monday and Thursday, so much has happened. (laughs) Uh, Big news that broke today which some of us found out about the last day or so, is about a brand new Paul McCartney seven in singles box set, which is coming out on December the 2nd. It spans his entire solo career from his first single, Another Day, Back With A Woman or Why, to the most recent single of Women and Wives and the version of Women and Wives from uh, McCartney 3 Imagined with uh, St. Vincent. Altogether, there are 159 songs coming from 80 singles. Only 3,000 copies will be made of this box set. You can buy up to two copies. The box set features recreations of 65 singles, complete with their original B-sides using restored artwork from 11 different countries, as well as 15 singles never before released on 7-inch. These 15 singles are made up from tracks previously released on 12-inch records, picture discs, CD singles and promos, digital downloads, music videos, two previously unheard demos, and there's also a previously unheard 7-inch single edit. The box set is beautifully presented in a special wooden art crate It's designed and built in Derbyshire in the UK and is packed with incredible content, including a 148 page book that features a personal forward by Paul, an essay by music journalist Rob Sheffield, and extensive chart information, liner notes, and single artwork. Each box includes a randomly selected exclusive test pressing of one of the singles. It's all very interesting. Um, With all this news, there's been no mention about Paul's archival releases of his albums, like the highly anticipated London Town and Back to the Egg. But it is interesting that for many of the songs in this box set, including songs from London Town and Back to the Egg, it says that it comes from a 2022 remaster. Mm -hmm. Now, some surprise choices here include Paul and Wing's cover of Love is Strange, the single edit. Strange, since it was pulled from being released as a single. Mm -hmm. And then you have to question the singles from which country. There's the single from Mrs. Vanderbilt, backed with Bluebird. Um, Although not released in the US or UK as a single, but in continental Europe and Australia. 
There's also a seven and single edited version, the one that I mentioned before, the single edit for Secret Friend. Other surprises include a demo version for I Want to Come Home and a demo for Dance Tonight. There's also a live version for House of Wax in there. I'm thinking that might be from the Amoeba Music Store. I'm not sure. Um, the list price for this is $611. And I know that the two of you have ordered it already. <laughs> what do you think about this, guys? This really took us by surprise. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of money for a relatively little amount of um, new things. And even there, new is in sort of quotes. Um, it looks like sort of a nice piece in the same way that the wooden box of uh, All Things Must Pass was a nice piece. But yeah, pretty pricey, I have to say. And uh, yeah, I had the two little guys on my shoulders, you know, I mean, it's time to draw the line. No, but you know, you are a McCartney biographer. <laughs> if this isn't tax deductible, what is, you know? <laughs> Well, come on, Alan, you have all those singles, you have all those tracks. Well, but you know, you have to. So uh, I finally just gave in just to make them shut up. <laughs> Where are they right now, your little friends, by the way? They're sleeping with the cats. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe they are the cats. <laughs> <laughs> I have those same guys, but they're, they're with me 24 seven constantly. I mean, it's just, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, I was completely blindsided by this announcement. Um, somebody had let me know uh, a couple of days ago that some something was coming, an announcement was coming. And of course, I'm sure those who got a hint, uh, had a hint that an announcement was coming, you immediately think, oh, it's going to be let it. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's going to be London Town or Back to the Egg or one or both of them or oh, and i got excited about the prospects maybe paul's putting a new album out mm -hmm. uh and then i see the singles and i'm like really do we do we need this while i'm thinking in the back of my head all right where am i going to find the cash to buy because i'll be buying it um we've reached a point i think where the collectible has to really be an eye catcher to, to, to get you to buy more physical product. You know, the box sets started to become more and more elaborate as we were being told that physical formats were dying. But yet here came, here would come, you know, the 25 disc box set. Mm -hmm. And then two years later, the 25 disc box set now came with, like in the case of some of the Pink Floyd box sets, marbles and scarves. You know, and then it was the next thing. And, and now we've reached this point where um, these massive multi-disc sets don't have to be CDs anymore now. Now they could be vinyl records. I'm telling you, uh, it sounds like I'm joking. I'm waiting for how long it's going to take before we get a massive cassette box set from some artist because cassettes are, 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 are back. And... I kind of was excited, a little piece of me was excited, but, you know, I was looking through the track listing, getting very anal about, like you pointed out, Ken, what they chose to put in the box set, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, different countries, and you get Mrs. V uh, was it Mrs. Vander Vanderbilt single. Yeah. But you're not, I don't believe you're getting Eat at Home on a 45, which was a, I, I could be wrong, I don't remember seeing it. Because uh, Eat at Home was a single in like Germany and some other countries. We got Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey and it was the backseat of my car in the UK. But Eat at Home was a single, uh, in, at least in Germany, I'm sure other countries. I didn't notice Eat at Home included. No, I'm looking right now. It's not on there. Um, okay. Band on the Run. Why? Where is Zugang? You know. Exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Um, 1985 well i mean if you're really going to make a complete box set should you have two band on the run singles in the set why did zoo gang get the short end of the stick uh then there's the edit you pointed out i don't want a 10 i don't want an edit of secret friend if i've just dropped 600 dollars hmm. on a box set this is not an edit that i that that 
I've ever heard of. It doesn't exist as far as I know. I'm not sure about this, but I know that Secret Friend was the flip side of the 12 inch yeah. secretary. Yeah. But I think that there were DJ copies that went out and maybe there's, there's a radio edit for Secret Friend there. It's possible. I mean, it's possible. Some B-side in Lithuania or something like that. It's out there, you know. Um, what about the edit of, of With a Little Luck? Now, if I'm not mistaken, With a Little Luck, the full album version was a single, at least in the U.S. There was no edit released That's commercially, right? That was only what went to radio stations. The radio station had the edit. Now they're shoving the edits down our throat with on wingspan, if I'm not mistaken, has the edit or it has an edit of a single that was a promo edit. It had um, Junior's Farm. Right. Uh, so, so these little quirks, you know, and how are you going to properly handle the singles that come out, came out in the CD era when vinyl was being phased out where the what a single was was really blurred. It could be one song and six non-album tracks and remixes and and dance mixes and stuff like that. So I don't know. I just felt like this was while a, a great looking project and and something that uh, listen when you're playing these records, it's going to be a lot of fun. But it just probably could have made a better decisions on what to put out. The other thing is. This was one, put out a 10 CD box set of all the singles, as opposed to all these 45s, you know, put ten, however many CDs you need to fit all this music and give me everything. Mm -hmm. Zoo Gang, everything on a CD box set of, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 discs. It would be small compared to some of the box sets coming out today, uh, as opposed to 80 vinyl singles. You know what this is reminding me of when they put out the um, the Beatles Christmas messages in a box set, but it was just the vinyl. And but at least that was just seven. You know what I mean? It was a manageable amount. And you had the feeling that I'm going to go buy this. I'm going to buy two because I want to keep one sealed, you know. Mm. And this is the kind of thing, though, that in five years could come back and have another life in another form. Seven discs. Seven vinyl singles is a heck of a lot different than 80 of them. Hmm. Um, I even got, I was thinking to myself, quality control. I drop over $600 for this box set. Who's to say that in two years when I finally get down to listening to the 67th single in the box set, I'm listening in order, it's not defective. A bad pressing, right? And I'm like, I don't want a bad pressing of Dance Tonight, which I can't find. What did you say? It was an edit. Um, a Here's demo the, version? Demo version of Yeah. Well, well, watch it skips. I can't do anything about it now. Right. Damn it. He said <clears throat> well, just buying it just a couple of hours ago. So yeah. you know, it's it was it it's it's an unnecessary release, but if it's going to be out there, and if you're a completist and a hardcore fan, listen, it'll be fun, it'll be a nice piece to have. And, um, you know, just one more way to lure people like us to buy a physical piece of music because, uh, you know, there's, you know, what's next? Well, all I can think to say is that uh, Paul McCartney is for the collector. He's a collector's dream because he puts out a lot of limited edition releases through the years. And um, I like the idea that he's addressing the fact that he's had this long, very successful career. He's put out so many singles. And I also love the fact that he's got, well, almost <laughs> all of the singles in the box set. If you notice, by the way, all the singles are what he released as a single himself or on his albums. You won't find The Girl Is Mine in here. You won't find the Kanye West stuff. Right. I noticed that. And those charted. Um, you know. I, um, I, sorry. Just the fact that I, I, like, I like knowing that in this collection, you're going to get Give Ireland Back to the Irish and Mary Had a Little Lamb, which weren't in other Greatest Hits compilations. But it shouldn't be limited to just this. And I like the fact that it's all got the picture sleeves and the artwork, the original artwork. And I think that's so wonderful. But 
I'm someone who has to have everything that's been released. I don't have to have every version of everything. Right. You know, if there's one song in this box set that has never come out before, and evidently there are like the, the, the demo for I Want to Come Home or uh, Dance Tonight, although I'm not sure where that comes from exactly. But, um, you know, I, I'm not going to spend $600 for one or two songs. But I, I like the, the fact that he's addressing this and he's putting out something nice. And um, for people who are collectors, this is an investment. Maybe they'll resell it years later. It'll be worth so much more. Let me, let me just jump in with one more thing that sort of puts the, this McCartney set into perspective and maybe makes it uh, seem a little bit more uh, of a, an essential positive uh, item that's coming out for lack of a better way of putting it i hold this up i don't know if it'll be backwards emerson lake and palmer okay earlier this year emerson lake and palmer released singles a box set of 12 seven inch singles now emerson lake and palmer is not a band that i'm even thinking about singles Mm -hmm. But here they put out this box set with 12 seven inch singles. I'm assuming these are the singles that, you know, came out in different countries and whatnot. The pieces must be he so heavily edited because they're 45s. And uh, for the 12, uh, 12 singles and you get all kinds of other tchotchkes in there, it's $92. All right. So McCartney 80 for 600 and change legitimate all-time hit maker versus prog band with uh you know single edits galore on 12 vinyl singles so it's the nature of the beast that we live in today right and, uh, but, you know it's just like with mccartney it's for the collector mm -hmm. it's always going to be those elt fans that have to have everything the completest like we said before so it's just addressing them you know but um Again, very interesting. I was expecting something else. I was expecting news about an archival box set or yeah. maybe a new album or maybe something about It's a Wonderful Life. But we'll have to wait to see uh, when we'll hear something about that project. But in other news, great news about the release of Revolver. It debuts back, or you could say re-enters, Billboard's top 200 album charts at number four. And it's on the UK charts, debuting at number two. Both of them behind Taylor Swift's latest album, Midnight's, which uh, is at number one. The UK also has a vinyl-only chart where Revolver debuts at number one. So I say this all the time, name any other band whose old albums can re-enter in the top 10 on the charts in America and in the UK and other countries as well. Uh, there will be a new single from the forthcoming live album from Ringo Starr and his all-star band from the new Live at the Greek Theater 2019. And that's Hamish Stewart's song with the average white band called Work to Do. The song is in fact an old Isley Brothers song and a new video has been made for the song, which you can check out on YouTube. Really good performance overall. Love all the camera work. Every time there's a solo, camera zeroes in on that musician. It's a really good performance, and Hamer sings it really well. All right. Remember uh, that live recording of Yoko and the Plastic Ono Band that we reported on earlier? It was recorded in Japan in 1974. And it now has an official release on CD on uh, November the 18th. It's called Let's Have a Dream 1974, One Step Festival. You can purchase it on Amazon, although it has a steep price, $56.98. The music was made available on YouTube and Spotify. Uh, certainly, from my point of view, one of the greatest tribute concerts ever, the concert for George, will be shown in select movie theaters on November 29th, oh, nice. on the 20th anniversary of the concert, which took place one year after George's passing. It included a star-studded cast of not only great musicians, but also people that were special in George's life, 
Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, Eric Clapton, Jeff Lynne, Tom Petty, Gary Brooker, Billy Preston, Ravi and Anushkar Shankar, members of Monty Python and more. The film will get a 2022 update with a Dolby Atmos remaster, as well as new introductions from Olivia and Danny Harrison, who also joined this superstar lineup of artists honoring his dad on stage. If you want to find a list of movie theaters and ticket information, you can go to the film's website at concertforgeorge.com. Speaking of the Harrisons, a special event will be taking place in New York City at the 92nd Street Y Kaufman Concert Hall on November the 20th. Olivia Harrison will be joined by Academy Award winning director Martin Scorsese to discuss Olivia's new book of poems called Came the Lightning, 20 Poems for George. You can hear them delve into the intimate stories of grief and sustained emotional connection told through Olivia's deeply moving poems. Uh, you can hear about Martin Scorsese's longtime fascination with George's music and much more. You'll recall Scorsese also directed the Harrison documentary, Living in the Material World. Tickets are available at the website 92y.org slash events. And you can purchase tickets to be there in person or to watch it online. Speaking of special events in New York City, Darren, before the show, was telling me, <laughs> don't look so shocked, about something that's about to take place in December of interest to all the fans. Yes, and no sooner does he pick up his iPad than he closes out the window. That has the info. Here we go. Uh, coming on uh, Wednesday, December 7th at the Paley Center for Media in New York City, uh, which used to be the Museum of Television and Radio going way back when. The Paley Museum is located at 25 West 52nd Street, FYI. On Wednesday, December 7th at 6.30, uh, reading this right off the press release, from paperback writer to the rooftop concert, directing The Beatles. Legendary film and television director Michael Lindsay Hogg and others will discuss and screen some of the 1966 promo films he directed for the Beatles, Paperback Rider, and Rain during the Revolver era, and the group's famous 1969 final live performance rooftop concert upon their Apple Corps headquarters in London. Uh, uh, appearing at this event uh, will be Michael Lindsay Hogg, Jonathan Clyde of Apple Corps, producer of the Beatles' Get Back, Rob Sheffield, contributing editor at Rolling Stone and the author of Dreaming the Beatles, The Love Story of One Band in the Whole World. And the moderator is Joe Scarborough from MSNBC mm -hmm. and the program Morning Joe. Tickets will go on sale to the general public on November 15th, which is next week. I think it's a Tuesday at 12 noon for the event taking place Wednesday night, December 7th at 6.30 at the Paley Center for Media. Hmm. Okay, very good. I'm happy for Joe Scarborough. He's a big Beatle fan. He talks about the Beatles all the time. Oh, does he really? I don't think mm -hmm. I've ever seen him on TV. Oh. Really? Oh. I don't think I have, but well, that's cool. His wife, The Morning Show, Morning Joe, really popular program. All right. He's always bringing up the Beatles. He's always referencing the Beatles on his show. And, and the Mets. Knows. Yeah, there you go. Oh, we all, well, I have to write, make sure you. Yeah, now you'll watch the show. <laughs> Start watching. <clears throat> okay. Um, hey, Darren, Alan, he talked about the song Six O'Clock on his show. Really? I, I missed that one. Okay. <laughs> he knows his stuff. All right, more Beatle news here. The Traveling Wilburys recording of their song, End of the Line, is in the trailer for the new Tom Hanks movie, A Man Called Otto. There is supposed to be a soundtrack album coming out in January, although I don't have a track listing yet. Would be nice if the Wilbury song was in it. Uh, thanks to one of our listeners, Scott O'Rourke, for that information. Uh, the brand new issue of Goldmine Magazine has the Beatles on the front cover. Of course, it's all about Revolver. The front cover reads, Beatles back with Revolver, remixed and reloaded. 
Thanks to John Bazzini for that information. The November issue of Mojo Magazine is dedicated to the recording sessions for Revolver. It comes with a small poster and a CD. Thanks to Bob Tavares. So many of our listeners contribute news to this show and my other podcast. Now, this is not exactly new, but it will be for some of us. Ringo Starr drums on a CD by Alan Darby called Rolling Man, which was released earlier this year. Ringo drums on the song Deep in the Heart of Me, and Ringo is heard in the song's introduction thanking Alan Darby for letting him participate in this release. The CD appears to be a charity release. Proceeds going to Turn Up for Recovery slash Crossroads. You can purchase it at this website, turnupforrecovery.org slash Alan Darby, A-L-A-N-D-A-R-B-Y. We must mention the passing of rock and roll pioneer Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry was one of several rock artists of the 50s that the Beatles greatly admired, known for such classic songs as Whole Lot of Shaking Going On and Great Balls of Fire. The Beatles used to perform several of Jerry's songs, including those two, and High School Confidential. Also, You Win Again, which was also done by Hank Williams, who wrote the song, and Fools Like Me. This is all in Mark Lewis's book, The Beatles Live. Uh, during the Plastic Auto Band sessions, John jammed on Jerry's song, It'll Be Me, which is on the Plastic Auto Band archival box set. And Jerry Lee Lewis's album from 2006, Last Man Standing, has Jerry doing a duet with Ringo Starr of the Chuck Berry classic, Sweet Little 16. Very sad to hear about Jerry Lee Lewis. He was 87 couple more things you got the new release coming november 25th ringo live at the greek theater coming out on two cd which is what i'm holding right here a two cd blu-ray also dvd also a blu-ray and uh an exclusive vinyl release double yellow vinyl i've heard uh for uh, november the 25th and like i said before a brand new video for the single work to do that you can watch online. Finally, it has now been announced that the next Fest for Beatle fans will take place March 31st, April 1st and 2nd, again at the Hyatt Regency, Jersey City on the Hudson. Special guests so far, there'll be more added on, are Peter Asher, Patty Boyd, Mark Rivera, Mark Lewison, Jay Bergen, The Weaklings, and others. Okay, always go to thefest.com for more information. And that be it for news. Okay, then. Out, outstanding. Yeah. I even so, took the notes. <laughs> outstanding. So on to the Revolver remix. You know, like all of these remixes, there's been a lot of debate about whether there needs to be a remix in the first place, about what Giles did that someone didn't like and someone did like and, you know, whatever. So I'm not going to go track by track, but um, shall we just sort of go around for general impressions first? Should start with Ken. I was very impressed with everything that I heard. I mean, I've had no problems so far with the remixes of all the Beatles box sets. The sound quality is great. The clarity is just amazing. I have to keep wrestling in my mind this whole idea about remixing because to me, the Beatles catalog was perfect the way that it was. There are a lot of Beatles fans that don't feel that way. And in many ways, stereo was still, at least certainly for rock music, a new thing around the time of the early 60s through the mid 60s. And they were experimenting with it. And there are some things that bother me about the original mixes of Beatles songs, especially lead vocals in one channel, or if you can't hear Paul's bass playing, or if the, the drums are kind of buried. And so for, for Beatle fans like that, they want to see changes made. And I think a lot of them would be quite pleased with everything that Giles Martin has done. And, you know, the problem with someone like myself is I was brought up on these mi mixes my whole life. I never really com complained about it all that much, but I can also understand, you know, I, like I said, I don't like Lee vocals in one channel. When you have it more centered, I think it's a more powerful recording. Everything that I've heard on the remix sonically sounds absolutely wonderful. 
And uh, it's something that I would go back to again and again and again to listen to. Whether or not I will ever say it's a definitive way to listen to the Beatles, that remains to be seen. Because like I said, when something's been in your system the way that it has been for most of my life, I've accepted it the way that it is. But, you know, there are certain songs in here that I think are vast improvements, mainly because certain instruments or lead vocals have been centered. And I like that more. And I think it's more powerful that way. There was a question that I actually wanted to pose to the two of you about this. Because I remember when the Sgt. Pepper box set first came out and there was a listening session in New York and Giles Martin was there and he was kind of talking about how he kind of wanted to bridge the gap between the mono and the stereo so that there were elements of the mono releases in the stereo remixes. And I kind of feel like he's carrying on that tradition <laughs> in some ways, um, especially when you talk about a song like Eleanor Rigby where Paul's lead vocal is always in the, the right channel. And now the lead vocal is in both channels. And I think right. it's much better for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I really liked a lot is the beginning of Got to Get to Into My Life, where the horns were always just in the right channel. Now it's in both channels. And it's so much more powerful that way. Of course, you could always say, you might as well have listened to the mono mixes all these years. Right. So right. I understand that logic. This could be a never ending conversation talking about remixes and, and which way to go. I mean, I was brought up for the most part with stereo mixes growing up since I was a kid and I accepted it, but the Beatles never cared about the stereo mixes and they didn't really spend that much time on them until later on. And so I've been listening to their recordings in a way that they didn't really put the effort in when it came to the mixes. You know, a lot of those stereo mixes were kind of rushed and done in a few hours. And yet I accepted it <laughs> all these years. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at this catalog as being as close to perfect as can be, it's hard for me to be all that critical of that catalog, mainly, I guess, because the songs are so great. But overall, I'm very pleased with what I'm listening to. And the one thing that I've maintained since the very beginning is as long as the original mixes are available that they don't go out of print i don't want this to be the only way that we listen to the beatles music the new remixes and i would almost prefer if new generations of fans heard the original mixes first mm -hmm. but i'm very pleased with what i'm listening to mm -hmm. you know anytime that i hear something different that i never heard before i'm thrilled but yet i also have to question would the beatles have wanted it that way well, two of them are alive and have approved it, so. I know, but I, <laughs> you know, in, in the days, in the 60s, all four of them were there to approve everything. So I know it's, it's, um, it's a very debatable thing. Mm -hmm. You just don't know with, with John or George how they would feel about any of this stuff coming out, especially after what you've told me, Alan, about how fussy George Harrison could be with the Beatles anthology release and what came out there. Right. So, yeah. And certainly when it comes to the outtakes, I don't know if John and George would be approving a lot of this stuff, hmm. but I'm still glad that it's out there, you know, but I also care about what the Beatles thought. Darren. I found that the uh, new stereo mix on this revolver is probably as close to the original mix as all of the box sets that have come out, starting with Sgt. Pepper. Um, it's almost as if with Sgt. Pepper, the whole concept was new. The Beatles are about to get remixed by Giles Martin. And we're going to get this box set with all these outtakes. And we're going to get a new way, a new, a new fangled way to listen to uh, the stereo mix. And then the White Album came out. It seemed like that kind of took it. I don't know if I'd say it was a more of a drastic um, reimagination of Sgt. Pepper. But they were similar in that when you listen to them, one listen, you were hearing things constantly. Guitar solos that were crisper. Uh, a backing vocal you didn't hear the first time. 
but it was buried in there all these years. Some maybe some instrumentation that wasn't uh, in the mix or was buried so low we couldn't hear it. Now it's present. And it seemed as though then with Abbey Road and Let It Be, and now definitely with Revolver, the remixes have sort of been tamed so that there's less of these uh, discoveries, which some people will find jarring, those who are purists and who don't like, you know, this tinkering with the past. Revolver, the remixes, the discoveries, the audio discoveries are all very subtle and they add up to this really crisp, clear whole, as opposed to hearing a guitar solo in a way that you've never heard it before, or, you know, a vocal uh, that you actually can think, you think you're hearing something totally different. Uh, the vocals are up front. The vocals are clear. They're present. Ken pointed out Eleanor Rigby. It seemed as though the vocal tracks on Revolver um, on this on this new mix really um, are the songs that shine because you're able to hear the the singing's a little closer to you without it being altered in any way. If you know what I'm saying, I I really uh, got a kick out of um, some of the guitar playing uh, that was. To my ears, what I've been hearing all these years, it just it, it just jumped out at you more. It was more present. So I think that if you're the type of person that would prefer they not remix, this is a remix for you, you know, because it isn't there isn't anything that's so blatantly obvious jumping out that I think all of us find very exciting. I mean, some of those, some of those, you know, those audio discoveries on the White Album remix, like flipped me out hearing these things that were buried or weren't even there, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It's all subtle and it all adds up to a, just an enhanced listening experience. I can't really single out any individual song that is more eye-opening than the one that came before. It's just, it, it, it seemed across the board, Giles Martin, I don't want to say he was kind of um, heavy-handed with the remixes years ago, and he isn't now, but it just seems as though he were at a point now where the, the this remix is subdued, yet there's a clarity and a sharpness to it, as opposed to a deeper bass solo that you never knew Paul was playing that all these years. The drums are crisper up front. I know, I know what I was going to say before. Another thing that Ken, you pointed out were the vocals. Was it got to get you into my life? Did you say? Yeah. yeah. The fact that they've been, uh, some of these vocals have been centered is this very subtle, simple way of making them up, come out and pop out of the speaker more. Uh, as opposed to being tucked away the way we heard it all this time. Didn't do anything more than balance them. And it made a, a, a world of difference. And like you said, if you're the type of listener that all you need to know is it's been remixed, I'm not interested, we still have the original mixes that are out there. I still think they should be part of these box sets, but that's I'm in the minority in that thinking. Okay. That's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay. Before we started, um, Ken mentioned that we had had listener questions about the difference between remixes and remastering. So just basically remastering is you're taking the finished mixed tape, whether mono or stereo, and you're creating a new master starting with the tape, but then the, the, the metal parts from which a record is made and, and, um, the pieces from which a CD is made. You're, but, but you're basically dealing with the record as you've always heard it. And remastering can, uh, you know, you can do some things with EQ. You can make things sound a bit better or a bit hotter. 
Uh, you can also wreck it by brick walling it, which is sort of getting rid of the dynamic range and making it all just sort of, uh, uh, some people use the word loudified. Remixing is when you go back to the master session tapes, the multi-track session tapes and make a new mix. It's pretty straightforward. I think that's probably all we need to say. If anyone's confused, write in and we'll clarify further. Um, well, mm. One thing I was going to say is the remastering. You figure that when an album was mastered for vinyl, when cutting the vinyl, when creating the, the, the stamper to press the records, mm -hmm. so many things needed to be taken into consideration right. um, about size of the groove, um, the super duper millisecond speed change that is, is evident when you're talking about different portions of the vinyl record that the, uh, that these things needed to all be taken into consideration to properly master uh, this tape to be heard on a piece of plastic. Now, with our technology today, you can widen everything out digitally and take full advantage of the fact that the limitations of vinyl and there were limitations to it are either gone or it's just all different. You get it. You're creating a new model. You're looking at the same model, but this is a different size one because we have a bigger room now. So let's make the model bigger to fit the room. The remix is right. I, I, um, Alan, remixing, you're going back to the uh, individual elements. Right. You know, and you're actually playing with faders and individual instruments and bringing, and, you know, and actually going, doing version two. Right. Of, of of this of, of a recording right. yeah, to me remixing is is like you were saying Darren it's when you're kind of you can affect the balance of the different instruments in the overall sound you can bring up the bass if you want to you can bring up the drums if you want to you can bring down one instrument if you want to um, you can bring lead vocals down if you felt that it was too loud before you can play around with it a lot and um you know, it's a whole other animal to me than than remastering. Remastering, I think, well, of course is it is. <laughs> it, they're trying to capture the original mix the way that it was with the best sound quality with using today's modern technology. Right. And um, you know, I certainly have never had a problem. You can take any classic catalog and remaster it every ten years, every twenty years. It should be done. Okay, remixing is really it's playing with the beast. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's a toy of yours and you can remix it the way you want to. You can, it could, you could have a totally different um, effect on you. The way that you hear certain things that you didn't hear before, like you were saying with, with the revolver remix. I mean, a song like Dr. <clears throat> Rock, I hear more of George's guitar playing throughout these little pills that he put in if you want to call it that on guitar that I didn't hear as much before now for some people that's a good thing you're hearing something you didn't hear before but it's not in keeping with the way that you originally heard it so should you be a purist and just say the way that it was at first is the way that we should always listen to it and maybe there's a reason why we shouldn't have heard all these other things in the songs and also you can also you can question Maybe it's because of the limited technology that we had back then, and we only had four tracks, and you had to cram a lot of instruments on each track that you couldn't play with each individual instrument like you can now. Right. So there's, there's benefits. And then, you know, if you're someone that still looks at that, if you treasure the catalog the way that it first came out, some people don't want it tampered with. Right. Okay. One of the reasons for remixing Revolver actually came up a year ago when Giles said that he couldn't remix Revolver, which was that in a lot of cases, the, the basic tracks, which are generally speaking, bass, drums, and rhythm guitar, were recorded straight to a single track. So that recording is in mono. And there's nothing you can do to spread it out as it is. In other records like Pepper and 
and later, I mean, in, well, with the White Album, they started using a track with Pepper. What they began to do is make a lot of intermediate mixes, which they did in Revolver too. Before Revolver, they didn't make too many intermediate mixes. But in other words, if they had their four tracks and they wanted to add more, they needed extra tracks. So they would take those four tracks and they would make a mix, an intermediate mix. Um, once they made that intermediate mix in the 60s, that track was set. You couldn't reconsider those balances. After the 60s, like now, they had saved all of the multi-tracks, the original multi-tracks from before the intermediate mixes. So they transferred those to digital. So now everything is, is on its own track. But in a case like Revolver, everything isn't on its own track because they recorded those basic tracks to a single track. This is where Peter Jackson's demixing system, uh, machine-assisted learning, or MAL, uh, also named for Mal Evans, that he demonstrated for us in episode 355 when we talked to Peter Jackson. If you haven't seen that, uh, you may be one of the few people in the world, um, but go back and have a look at that. He includes a demonstration of a mono piece of the get back footage where he takes away each instrument and takes away the voices and then puts them back. Um, really interesting. It also made it possible to, to listen to that lunchroom discussion that they had where the original tape is really just all clattering silverware and you can barely hear what they're saying. He was able to use the mal system to get rid of all the noise and give us the conversation. So with Revolver, um, Giles Martin now has, thanks to the MAL system, all of those tracks that were recorded together into a single track in mono now are separated. And he even is able to separate the individual components of Ringo's drum kit. So that gave him a lot of freedom to put things different places that he felt a year ago, there's no point in making a mix if all you can do is move the rhythm section either to the right or to the left or, or to the middle, which makes it fundamentally mono. You know, and you can have other things off to the sides, but the basic track's going to be in the middle. And he didn't feel that that was um, quite enough. With Mal, he was able to have, you know, much more freedom. But apart from that, you know, actually, there were a lot of mixing mistakes on the stereo revolver. Yellow Submarine, you know, just for starters. Uh, now, this has been mixed four times now. 1966, 1999 on the Yellow Submarine song track, got a remix. 2015 for the one album, One Plus. And now for this one, the mistakes that are most easily spottable are, you know, when John repeats Ringo's lines in the stereo mix from 1966, he comes in late, like line, a line later than the mono mix, right? And the other thing was, and this isn't necessarily a mistake, this could be an artistic decision. You can go either way on this one. When the song begins and Ringo sings in the town, in mono, there's a guitar chord accompanying in the, comes right in at the first word. In yeah. stereo, it doesn't. In stereo, it's in the guitar chord on town, okay? I don't really want to say that's a mistake. I think they, I, I, I think that was a decision, okay? In 1999 and in 2015, John Lennon's answering vocals were restored, but the, the chord was not restored. On the new one, John's answering vocals are still restored and the guitar chord in the opening is restored as well. So that makes it a little bit more like the mono mix. Um, also, on, since given the sort of circus that Yellow Submarine is, Giles this time felt a bit freer about moving some of the sound effects around. The, uh, you know, captain, captain, that kind of thing. Those, those sort of move around the picture a little bit more than they did in 2015 or 1999 and certainly more than 1966. 
with Eleanor Rigby, another audible mistake. If you listen to it in, he in headphones, the 1966 version, you have centered vocals. I'll look at all the lonely people. And then Paul sings the solo vocal on the right channel. But it starts in the middle. You can hear it actually travel. Ellen, <laughs> <laughs> you hear it going across to the right. So now the lead vocal is centered. And so that doesn't happen. But for me, there's another attraction to the new mix of Eleanor Rigby. Um, although there was a bit of this in the 1999 mix, not too much of it in the 2015 mix. And that is that, okay, in 1966, the strings were recorded on four tracks and they were mixed to one track. So basically mono and centered in the mix. So you have the strings in the center and then the vocals starting in the center and going to the right. What you have here are the strings are placed in the stereo mix the way they would be if you went to a concert and saw them on stage. You've got the, the violins on the left, the violas in the middle, the cellos on the right. And that's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of a nice effect because if you're in a concert hall looking at a string octet, that's the way it is. And that's the way you hear it. In surround, they're all around you. And again, with, you know, since we talked about Yellow Submarine, Yellow Submarine is all around you too, especially the chorus vocals when it's like, we all live in a Yellow Submarine. That comes from the front and the back and you're just right in the middle of this whole crowd singing Yellow Submarine. Um, it's a nice effect. And, you know, elsewhere, uh, I, I don't know that the, there were things that you would really call mistakes in the original mix, but like Ken and, and Darren both said, everything is much more centered. The way it would be mixed today, not just because it's a mixing style, but because you had all of those tracks individually available to put any place you want. And he didn't go crazy with them. You know, it's a pretty conservative mix, but there are just improvements. And what I did when I listened to it is I made a playlist. And the playlist was Taxman 1966, Taxman 2022, Eleanor Rigby, 1966, 1999, 2015, 2022. And I listened to the whole thing with headphones so that, you know, there is no question about where anything is in the mix. It was really clear. And I, I, I just got to say that I, I really think the album sound has improved um, because apart from the balancing and the, the placements that make it more equally distributed, as Darren said, the instruments themselves sound a lot crisper, grittier, the guitars. It, 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 it really impressed me um, two things uh, just about the performance on this album. And it's an album I've listened to 80 gazillion times. But hearing the remix really gave me more of an appreciation of, you know, this is probably their most fluid guitar playing on any Beatles album from start to finish. It's just, you know, there's just great stuff going on in the guitar lines. And you especially can hear that as well in the, in the outtake mix of Got to Get You Into My Life. All those guitar parts that they decided to give to the brass instead, that, that was pretty cool. The brass on Got to Get You Into My Life has kind of a, a gritty edge that is a little smoothed over in the 1966 mix, but now you kind of hear it like brass playing in your room, you know? And in the surround mix, they're in the back. So you're hearing Got to Get You Into My Life and da 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 da, da and even crisper sounding than in the stereo mix, I have to say. Let's see. Oh, and the other thing is the vocal, the vocal uh, harmonies on this. I don't think I'd really appreciated how rich Revolver was in terms of harmonizing, but like every song has something and here, there and everywhere. I don't remember which one of you was saying, um, but about, you know, I think Darren about buried lines that come out, you know, in, in, in the White Album remix. Um, if you get the surround mix of this and 
there is a way to get the individual stems of the surround mix out of it and listen to them individually. That's where you're going to hear a lot of guitar parts you don't normally hear. There's one going on and she said, she said, for instance, uh, that's, that's really kind of cool. But the best fun I've had with the individual tracks of the surround mix were to take the left side and right side uh, channels, which have the vocal harmonies for here, there, and everywhere. And instrumental backing too, but no lead vocal and not even all the instruments. And that, that, that vocal harmony is just stunning. It's totally Brian Wilson inspired, no question about that, um, but it's just stunning. And I, last weekend, I, I just kept playing it over and over and over. I mean, really beautiful. Here, There and Everywhere is a great song. Love it with the lead vocal, but they could have released this as well without the lead vocal. Paul talks about uh, in the in 1970, 71, when they started going to Jamaica and getting into reggae, they talked about how the back of a single was just called version, yeah. which they did with uh, Give Ireland Back to the Irish. They put out an instrumental version and just called it parentheses version, you know, after Give Ireland Back to the Irish version. They could have done that with Here, There, and Everywhere without the lead vocal, but the harmonies emphasized. So that's basically, I guess, what I have to say about the remix. I mean, don't need to do every song, really. Um, but every song has been affected. I mean, nothing is exactly the same as it was. Everything is spread out a bit more nicely than it had been. I have two completely different questions for you, Alan, hmm. um, uh, unrelated. First of all, do you think that Giles Martin, this mix, uh, was the result of the old, the earlier albums that he remixed? Do you think he's learning uh, from what he's done in the past and that one album reissue remix is informing the other, the one to come? In other words, would Revolver have sounded like this, in your opinion, if this was the first album he did, not Sgt. Pepper? Hmm. I mean, can't say. I mean, every, everyone learns as they keep doing things. So, the, you know, there's obviously a learning curve. You know, my favorite remix actually is, is the one that, that you found so surprising, which is the White Album. Yeah. So, and there he, you know, he was a bit more out on the edge than he was here. He was pretty conservative, you know, apart from, apart from fixing the balances and fixing a couple of things like those mistakes in Yellow Submarine and Eleanor Rigby. It's, it's not radical in any way. I bet he just is looking at what the material is and whether it lends itself to a radical remix or not. You know, with Tomorrow Never Knows, he has some of that, um, uh, some of those loops going on different speakers, which right. wasn't the case in, in the 66 mix. So I, I think there he felt, you know, okay, this is, this is the kind of song and it's the kind of effect where that lends itself to something else going on. The other question I have really goes back to the beginning of your segment here. When you were talking, we were talking about remix versus remastering. How did the Beatles and other bands who did this how did they avoid loss and fidelity as they were essentially taking, say, on a four track, three tracks, combining them and essentially transferring them to the extra track? You lose a generation. That's right. You're doing that. It's like if you somebody at home would record a cassette to a cassette, the copy is not going to sound right because... It's a second generation. That happened. Oh, some bands were doing that a lot, even in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I was always amazed how, um, I don't know what on the dark side of the moon where they did a lot of that. And yet that is like an audiophile's dream, that album. How did they avoid loss of fidelity as they had to keep bouncing yeah. these things onto? I mean, they are getting some loss of fidelity. That's, I think, why instruments on on these remixes sounds so much crisper you know because there were there there was some loss of fidelity even going from 
the four track tape to the stereo mix. I mean, that's a generation loss too. But of course, we're, we're also talking about, you know, not quite copying cassette to cassette. We're talking about extremely high end equipment here. So the loss is going to be kind of negligible for the first couple of copies. You know, once you start copying more and more, it, you're, you're going to hear it. Um, that's why also you listen to some albums from the 70s and they're really hissy, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yep. I was just thinking that because of the fact that we have this advanced technology from Peter Jackson and his crew and you can isolate each instrument, even still, if you're going back to the release versions, you're dealing with, like we said, putting a lot of instruments on one track, transferring, transferring that to another track. So you still have loss anyway but now you can isolate those instruments so right. there's still be, it's still not going to be the the best from the original first recording of each instrument well except that now we're in the digital domain so you don't really don't really have the the same kind of losses in analog you know, one can argue about whether there's there's loss or degeneration of some kind some people say yes some people say the whole point of digital is that the hundredth copy is the same as the first copy. Okay. I've already sort of done some of mine, but um, do you want to go around and talk, uh, talk about favorite uh, improvements or differences? Yeah, mine was a, gen this, this was a general, nothing specifically, unless Ken, you want to. In my case, I found that other than the ones I mentioned, Eleanor Rigby and Got to Get to Into My Life, there are certain songs where I really like the changes that were made, but I still had some problem with it. You know, like, for example, I wrote down here in my notes about Good Day Sunshine. The original stereo mix, the introduction on the piano was mainly in the left channel only. Mm -hmm. And during the verses, they're in both channels. George Martin's piano solo is in the right channel. And uh, at the ending, it's bouncing in different channels with harmonies. Not sure what that meant. You might have um, to... In the remix, in the remix where they're, they're singing, good day, sunshine, good day, sunshine. Yeah. There he's got, um, got them spread across the two channels and in, in, in surround their in in the back too but that that i think what you probably meant was that that was a much more um striking or with depending whether you liked it or not effect uh, than 1966 one where they were all in the same place right but i also wrote that now the introduction on the piano is in both channels mm -hmm. George Martin's solo is mainly in the right but you hear some on the left um you hear more hand claps but the one thing that bothered me was that the last chord doesn't sustain like it did in the original. Hmm. It ends kind of abrupt. Okay? okay. Uh, it's like you, you don't really hear it um, when it comes to the word day. The, you hear the chord underneath good. And when it comes to day, it's not there. It's just harmonies. The original, I think, had a smoother ending. Mm -hmm. So I had a problem with that. For no one... Um, originally the piano was in the right channel the bass was in the left lead vocals were in both the French horn was in the left now the piano is in both the French horn is in both it has a much fuller sound but I hear less bass <laughs> you know yeah. so in some ways it's an improvement and then it's lacking in something else so a little bit of criticism there Darren did you have any no, I'm not really. Like I said, my my overall feel of 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 the remix, it's very consistent. Um, there's nothing jarring, whether positive or negative. Um, it just plays very upfront, very crisp, very clear. Uh, whether one song it might be the harmonies, another song it might be uh, the drum sound. Um, I will admit. I didn't pay very close attention like you guys did to the channel separation and all of that. I'll do it now. Kind of that really wasn't sort of on my radar. I'm looking for the presence of, 
you know, um, how crisp, how, how much the instruments popped as opposed to where, you know, in the, in the stereo spectrum, they were, they were placed. So um, it, to me, it was an easy, if, again, if you don't like these remixes, if you wish they never did them, this is probably a remix you should check out because you're probably going to find it to be acceptable. You might not be converted, but this is stayed very true. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, you're listening to it and you're like, I can't put my finger on it. This is, is really better, but it's not different. Right. And the interesting thing about that for me is that while it's, you know, it's, it's not a radical remix in any any way, um, but because right. of the instrumental clarity, because of the better balance, I think that's why I noticed more of the vocal harmonies and the guitar playing the, yeah. than I had uh, through gazillions of listens. And I think it gave me a greater appreciation for why people are so keen on Revolver as being the Beatles best album or, you know, greatest album of all time, some people say, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, I liked Revolver. I never disliked Revolver, but it never really was something that I thought about when people would say, what's your favorite Beatles album? And, you know, generally it was Pepper, um, maybe Abbey Road, you know, and then maybe the White Album. But in Revolver, you know, I thought of it as one of the sort of part of the mature period, one might call it, that begins with Rubber Soul or even parts of Help. I mean, yesterday's on Help. You can't say that's immature. But, you know, there's, there, there is sort of a leap that happens around there in 1965. And, and, you know, and I always thought of Revolver as obviously in that bunch of albums, but it uh, really until really focusing on it while listening to this remix, I, I never quite understood why people singled out Revolver as their favorite. And, and now I understand it a lot better. You know, I don't know that I still would say it's my favorite. I mean, I, I still like Pepper. I still like Abbey Road an awful lot for a lot of reasons, but I, I, I see the point now of, of Revolver being a, a, a top pick. Just out of curiosity, when, when the Beatles went from Rubber Soul to Revolver, you, you must have noticed how much they expanded in all the different musical genres that mm -hmm. they would oh, What yeah. a difference from, from one album to the next. I would think that you would have a, a far greater appreciation even earlier on of yeah. an album like that for that reason. And then once you add in all the sonic differences and all the advances they were making with technology and the different sounds and all that Jeff Emmerich brought to the table and the way that he mixed the album, and microphone placement and all that stuff. Once sure. you learn about that, um, the more education you have about a Revolver, the more you appreciate it. But even initially, I would think, it's like we talked about this many times, how George Harrison said he didn't see the difference between Rubber Soul and Revolver. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like night and day to me. Oh, you know? yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, you're right. There were a lot of new sounds coming in with Revolver, starting with, you know, Love You Too. I mean, the sitar on Norwegian Wood is pretty much just a strange sounding guitar. It's just a single line of the melody of the song. You know, it's not particularly Indian. It's just an Indian timbre that most of us hadn't heard before. Love You Too is more like what Indian, Indian music is. You know, it's, it's more of that. It, 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 and it, he's got the tabla and he's got the drone instrument that Paul's playing. It's a lot closer to what he's focused on in his passion for Indian music. Hmm. And we hadn't heard anything like that before. I mean, unless we'd been listening to Indian music, but certainly not through the Beatles or, or any rock album and you know got to get you into my life i mean i always think of you know you've seen that clip of them in um Hillichem in holland um being interviewed and and they're saying you know do you think your music will change you know and paul says well you know it's like if you're if you mean like would we have like a a, a big band kind of sound no we'd never do that and i always think i've got to get you into my life 
you know, that, that should be a jump cut, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, look, they'd had, they'd had strings before on yesterday. And so now, you know, they've got more strings on Eleanor Rigby, but you know, the brass in uh, Got to Get You Into My Life and in Yellow Submarine, although that is, a uh, uh, we, we learned from the book that is from EMI's um, effects closet recordings, not an actual band playing it. That, that I didn't know, that was interesting. And then of course the electronic stuff and the backwards stuff. It, 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 it really is a big jump. Why didn't I appreciate it as much at the time? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, the thing is that, um, you know, Pepper was only 10 months later and Pepper did a lot of the same stuff. It had a lot of experimental electronic kind of things, you know, benefit of Mr. Kite and the, you know, tape cut up and thrown up in the air and re-spliced. A lot of that kind of thing that really has its roots in Revolver. Maybe it was that you know, we were used to used to it a little in Revolver, and now this sort of is is more Technicolor version of it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how it. And and, and people also say a lot. I mean, I've I've heard this argument made many times, and I think it's made in the book too. The fact that those three songs were taken off the American Revolver, which is what we grew up with, mm -hmm. changes changes the whole balance of the album. So, you know, that could have something to do with why I or other American listeners didn't really cotton on to Revolver as being that big a, a, a leap or, or whatever. I mean, it was a leap. Also, and, and, and we'd heard those three songs on Yesterday and Today in advance and packaged with more sort of normal Beatles songs like We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper and Yesterday. So it was like we got eased into the Revolver sound. Yeah, so. I've been thinking that too. The transition was a lot smoother. By hearing something like I'm Only Sleeping with backwards guitars, it prepared you. Maybe mm -hmm. tomorrow never knows wasn't as shocking because you heard I'm Only Sleeping a few months before that. Maybe. That's right or rain for that matter. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I th I've listened to the British albums pretty much exclusively since about 1973. And that's an awful long time, right? Mm -hmm. But playing Revolver now, when I hear Dr. Robert, I want it to go into yesterday, <laughs> like on the Yesterday and Today album, just something in, you know, the inner ear sort of prepares you for yesterday, but it goes elsewhere. So. It's weird because I haven't really listened to the American Rubber Soul for a long time. But still, when I hear certain songs like It's Only Love, yeah. <laughs> I'm expecting to hear a girl next. Yeah. <laughs> it's because your yeah. ears are so used to it, must have left some impression. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And for me, it's for me, it was the Beatles' second album because that was one of the first I got when I was really little and I had it on cassette and hearing. The songs, the U.S. mixes in that configuration, mm. you know, when, it, when they're popping up on other albums today, it's like, that sounds all wrong, you know. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think if there's anything else to say about the surround mix. It's, um, you know, it's a pretty conservative mix, but it really, you know, like like all of them, it, it sort of envelops you and, you know, you feel like you're sitting in the center of the band and it's really nicely done. Not, um, not real adventurous. It could be more adventurous given what the material is, but it's fine. It, 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 it surrounds you. It's kind of, it surrounds you in a visceral way. And then of course, there's listening to the individual stems. The one thing I have to say about it is, you know, I still would have preferred that it came on a Blu-ray. I tried pretty hard to find a version of the surround mix to buy and could not. I eventually got it because you can get anything you want at Alice's <laughs> Restaurant. Um, and I got it and I got the individual stems and all kinds of stuff. I would have been happy to buy it, Apple, but you have to make it easier to find. Of course, 
that money now went into Paul's single set. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, all roads lead to the to Rome <laughs> or Liverpool. That was, or, <laughs> that was Paul's way of stopping you from going further down into the illegal recording route. That's right. He knows. That's right. I, I don't know if you want to address this or not, but when we did our last show talking about the outtakes, one of our listeners wanted us to talk about the differences in the versions that we heard on the Beatles anthology of Revolver to what appears here. Now, in reading the Kevin Howlett notes in the Revolver box set, we did learn that the, the backing tracks from Eleanor Rigby the string section is actually a completely different take right than the one that the beatles released mm -hmm. but uh there are supposed to be differences in tomorrow never knows take one right uh, you know what what that was because i didn't a b it yet the tomorrow never knows on the the new one is a bit longer the anthology is three minutes 14 and the uh new version is 333 there's some talking in the beginning, uh, other things happening. I, um, and your bird can sing. We got we got the anthology in two parts in the new version. You know, in the anthology, you hear the laughing version, but you hear it over a complete vocal take. It, it's right. as, you know, it's as if they're trying to double the vocals and they and they can't do it. Um, what we have in the new set is the take where they sing it fine and then the giggling version without any other vocals under it. So that's a, a, a bit different. They did remix them all. I didn't really uh, take notes on what the differences were between the anthology and these. Uh, a couple, I remember on, on one of them, I can't remember which one, towards the end on the anthology mix, which was maybe a, uh, an instrumental mix or some sort of a, a more spare mix that they faded in more of the finished tracks in the last verse. That was the kind of thing they did in the anthology because they were trying to show sort of a, a process, whereas here they're into showing more what the outtake was, you know, in all of these box sets. The, I think my, my sense of the outtakes in the box sets is that they're you know, purer in a way than the anthology. So I, I didn't really spend a lot of time comparing the ones from the anthology because that was sort of my general feeling anyway. I, I generally would prefer the more pure version of an outtake to hear what actually happened in the outtake. If you, if you start fading in tracks and things, it's, it's not really the outtake anymore as such. Okay, so that basically is our take on the remix of Revolver and some of the other remixes along the way. And uh, let's go around and give our contact information, starting with Darren. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm at WFUV, and if you want to tune in, if you're in the New York City metropolitan area, 90.7 FM, uh, or stream us at WFUV.org, or get our app. That's another uh, really cool way to download that. And you can listen there. Uh, and I'm on the air at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Monday night through Thursday nights, four nights a week. And from one until four o'clock on Saturday afternoons. Uh, and I have two Facebook pages. If you want to come get in contact with me, Darren DeVivo, send me a friend request. The other Facebook page, Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ and Beatles podcaster and click like or, or follow or whatever it is. And uh, that's a, probably the best way to keep in contact with me directly. Ben? All right. If you'd like to email me, my address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page, Ken Michaels. It has my face on it. <laughs> Along with my late dog, Nilsson, oh. named after Harry. And uh, so you can friend me on there. Um, as far as my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, my most recent interview was with Bruce Spizer and Al Sussman for the new book, The Beatles from Rubber Soul to Revolver. Talks about those two albums, plus yesterday and today, the Butcher cover, 
fans' reactions to all the music. It's really a great book. So it's all about that on uh, on my channel, Ken Michaels Radio. There'll be lots of new interviews coming in the next few weeks. If you can, please subscribe. My other uh, talk show podcast on the Beatles called Talk More Talk, which is mainly on the solo Beatles. Uh, we just did an interview with Jason Krupa, who is the host of the podcast Producing the Beatles. And he's also the co-author, along with Ken Womack, they were both on this show, for uh, the book on George Harrison and Eric Clapton call, called All Things Must Pass Away. And we talked about Revolver from uh, the position of a producer and how he looks at it and talking about the remixes there as well. That was a great show. You can uh, check us out on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Um, next show is going to be in three weeks on the 28th of November. We'll be discussing Ringo's Old Wave album mm. and reviewing that. Um, please subscribe to that channel. We're on all audio platforms for that. Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. There's my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, where <laughs> starting next week, you can win this new baby, Ringo Starr and his all-star band, Live at the Greek 2019. I will also have a special contest coming soon where you can win the two CD set and Blu-ray. On How did you get a copy already? What are you special? <laughs> Look who's talking, Mr. McCartney singles box set. Well, I mean, I didn't get it like here. Here's mine. I got it a month in advance. Signed by Paul. But uh, I do all kinds of contests on my website. So that's the place to turn to where you can win CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, books. Oh, by the way, starting next week, you can win this book. Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Chase Stadium. Did you get it, Darren? No, no, I'm not special like you, Ken. You were going to order it, you told I me. I was, yes, I no. I think I lost the notes that I wrote down after we finished recording our last show, so I'll have to go looking around. Well, you know, that, that McCartney box set is more important. Yeah, Darren and I listen to the news as our shopping list, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, this 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 time out, I mean, you know, now I'll lose mm -hmm. this in about two hours. I won't know. Right. It'll go under the couch. Mm. Slide under the couch later. Just play back one of our shows. That's all. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> and finally, my radio show, Every Little Thing. Um, just to make it easy on everybody, instead of going to my website and looking at all the radio stations that carry it and when the shows run, you can go to WFDU's website, Fairleigh Dickinson University. Normally they run my show, my radio show on the Beatles Sunday mornings at 6 a.m., but they now make it available on demand, the last two shows. Each show is on their website for two full weeks, so you can listen whatever you want during those two weeks. Go to WFDU.FM, uh, go to their archives page, recent archives, type in every little thing, and you can listen to my show to your heart's content, anytime within two weeks. Okay, wfdu.fm. And that about does it for me. Okay, um, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, there is also the McCartney Legacy Facebook page, which I guess as it gets closer, we're putting more little bits on there. Um, you can contact all of us three, at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. And we have two Facebook pages currently things we said today and things we said today Beatles radio fans. We hope you're watching this on YouTube, which I guess is the only place to get the video version. There is an audio version that goes out via Podbeam to iTunes and iHeartRadio and all kinds of other places. And yeah, you know, we're easy to find. Um, so tune in, look into some of the back issues, um, which are all posted on Podbean and YouTube, and I guess iTunes and some of the others too. So mm -hmm. thanks for listening. For Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>